In this part of the series, we're going to be talking about how to prevent pressure injury in the critically ill. If you joined us for part one, we talked about skin assessment and risk assessment. And so we're continuing the story now of what do we do with the critically ill patient. The incidence of pressure injury in the critically ill is quite high. And so we wanna do our best to reduce the number of avoidable pressure injuries in that population. I've organized the material for prevention of pressure injuries into four big buckets. One is reducing the intensity or the magnitude of pressure against the soft tissue and skin. Number two is reducing the duration of pressure against the soft tissue. Number three is reducing the shear forces against the soft tissue and the skin. And number four is improving the tolerance of the skin for pressure and shear. We're gonna start with the first one, reducing the intensity of pressure against the skin. So when we're dealing with that first aspect, which is the intensity or the magnitude of pressure against the skin and soft tissue, it's the support surface that plays a major role in that. And if you work in critical care, you probably are working with the best fleet of beds that your hospital can afford to place in the ICU. And that's exactly what you need to do. You need to spend money on the ICU beds because the general unit patients, med surge, medicine, tele, whatever, can do fine usually on just a foam mattress because they can move themselves. So what's the bed need to be in the ICU? It needs to be one that has good immersion and envelopment. Fancy words, I know. You want the patient to sink into the mattress. So it's like when you're sitting on the bleachers at a football game, you're not immersing into that wood or metal bleacher that you're sitting on. In contrast, when you're sitting in the pool, you're sinking in and the water's enveloping around you and therefore reducing the pressure against your body. So you want a bed that the patient can sink into. No, not sink in so far that you can't lift them up, but sink in enough that the pressure is reduced. Now the guideline makes some really good recommendations for bed selection across the board. One is that you need to make sure the width of the bed is adequate so that there's actually a place to turn the patient. So if the patient is wide in the belly and, and their belly or their arms and shoulders are already touching the side rails, where are you gonna turn them to? You, there's no place to go. And you end up physically trying to lift the patient off of the bed. Well, you're gonna get a back strain or a shoulder strain out of that. So get a bed that's wide enough to support the patient. And even though the beds today say that they can support a 500 pound patient, I think when you get over 350, you're really struggling a bit to make sure there's enough room to move in that bed. So do think about those features when you're purchasing or upgrading your ICU beds. If you don't have up-ticked ICU beds now, then you need to be thinking about overlays on the bed for those high-risk patients who are simply not moving and not active, often unconscious. We are proning a lot of patients today. We proned patients for many years that have ARDS, but we're using proning more today. So when you are proning a patient, you really need a better bed or an overlay under the patient. So an air-filled air mattress under the patient to give you additional envelopment and immersion into the surface. The anterior surfaces of the body are not well padded and patients end up getting pressure injuries while they're prone. In fact, pressure injury is the most common complication for a patient who's being prone. So before you prone the patient, I want you to be sure you're padding the patient well, applying dressings to protect those high risk areas, getting pillows to support the patient, not no pillows at the abdomen to make sure you've got space for the abdomen uh, to drop down toward the mattress. But the photographs you're seeing are patients who were prone and those are some of the pressure injuries that developed. So be aware of that risk, particularly in the patient that you're proning. One of the other ways to reduce the intensity of pressure against the skin and soft tissue is to use a multi-layer foam dressing. And so for the usual patient who's in semi Fowler's position, apply a sacral dressing to that patient and really the sooner the better. If this is a pre-op patient, get it on in pre-op. 
if this is a patient coming through the emergency room, ideal if you could put it on in the emergency room. Get it on at the time of admission to your ICU though, because you're gonna be turning that patient over if for no other reason to remove the linen out from under the patient upon transfer. And at that time you can inspect the skin and apply the dressing. So for the, for the patients who are prone, I want you to also use foam dressings and you don't need to go out and buy a whole new set of dressings. You can use the sacral dressing up on the upper shoulder. Some people have cut it in half and used it on the side of the face to protect the cheek and the ear. You can use the four by fours on the shins to protect the shins. So be sure you get those patients adequately padded before you flip them over into a prone position because they will be prone for a while. When you're about to prone a patient, I also want you to change out the endotracheal tube holder if you're using a commercial one and instead tape the ET tube in place. Due to the swelling of the face, uh, that swelling extends over the commercial tube and leads to some pretty nasty ulcerations of the face in those patients that were prone. In addition, put lubricant uh, in their eyes, not eye drops, but the ointments and tape their eyes closed and be sure that you adequately pad the face um, with dressings. Put a highly absorptive dressing under the mouth to absorb uh, the saliva that's gonna come from the patient once they're prone. The other area of the body that's at very high risk in the supine patient or semi-fowler's patient is the heel. I actually think the heel is the, almost the easiest pressure injury to prevent because you can float the heel in almost all situations. And if you can't float the heel, then put a dressing on the heel. Now I know what some of you are doing is using pillows to float the heel. And I wanna discourage you from doing that because in less, unless the pillow is really thick and full of foam, the weight of the leg is gonna collapse the pillow and the patient's heel is gonna be on the bed. If the pillow is fat and full of foam, it's actually gonna elevate it too much. So think about using uh, heel offloading devices, the various boots on the market. Uh, you've got to get the heels off the bed. Now, one of the things we see often in the critical care patient is the use of vasopressors to raise blood pressure and levofed being the most common one in use and sepsis being the most common reason for admission to ICU. So we see a lot of purple feet, just like you see in the photograph. That's not a deep tissue injury. That's ischemia that's gone on to blister. Not a good looking foot, I realize. Um, in fact, the patient went on to become fully necrotic after this photograph was taken. So the vasopressors don't lead to heel ulcers per se, but ischemic tissue doesn't tolerate pressure. So be very cautious with those patients. In fact, think about instituting strict heel precautions for your patients in the ICU, which means those heels are elevated off the bed. Nothing is attached to the heel that cannot be quickly removed. Elastic stockings are not used because they're extremely tight on the heel. Use sequential devices and other anticoagulants for that patient. 